so rather than doing too much preamble, I would love to have, um, you know, maybe Adam, if you can patch them in, um, our experts for this discussion of platform uh, versus government regulation in speech join. We have with us, and I'll let them give a little bit more introduction to themselves, but um, Anne Rabel, who's the former chair and commissioner of the FEC and is currently a US senatorial, I'm sorry, a CA, California senatorial uh, candidate. Uh, Elliot Schrag, the uh, former VP of comms and policy from Facebook. Um, Lee, uh, senior reporter at Coindesk. And then, you know, I'm obviously here. I'm Sam, I'm one of the, the partners at Slow Ventures uh, and a intern columnist for the information. Um, so I think, do we have, do we have our panelists up? I see Elliot and I think I see everyone. Nice to see you all. Thanks for joining. Um, maybe start very, very briefly. We'll do a lightning set of maybe longer introductions if you each want, um, kind of, of where you're coming from and maybe a little bit, you know, not too much, but a few, few moments on kind of your perspective on the issue of regulating free speech from a platform versus government perspective. And do you want to start it up? Happy to do that. Um, based on my experience, mostly at the FEC, as well as the State Fair Political Practices Commission, I see a lot of this issue through the lens of democracy and what is happening to our democracy um, on platforms. Um, so while I understand that free speech um, is a really important principle in our constitution. There are other constitutional principles as well. And there are some places where uh, speech um, has been curtailed because of uh, issues relating to democracy and voter suppression and um, harassment and a number of other things that I think need to be considered. Great, thank you. Elliot, you wanna jump in? Oh, we can't hear you. Sure. Right. Yeah, no, it, well, it, it helps if I turn off the mute. Um, so if you want to so speak my, freely, you should turn off the mute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my, my take on, on the topic today is that I, I feel like there is a role for government and there is a role for the platforms or the gatekeepers and that both are doing a terrible job. The platforms need to be very clear about what their standards are, what their processes are, uh, and the governments need to be much more explicit to decide and acknowledge in a very, very polarized uh, uh, environment, what are the appropriate contours for the restrictions or suppressions of speech. Um, my belief is that we actually do have uh, a history in the United States of permitting speech, having a strong bias in favor of permitting speech, even objectionable speech, certainly inaccurate speech. Um, uh, so long, you know, it, it, you know, so long as it it uh, uh, doesn't cause harm or certain other kinds of you know other kind kinds of uh, negative consequences. I believe it's up to governments to define the contours. I feel it's up to platforms to enforce the contours. And I think, moreover, beyond that, I think it's really up to uh, up, up to the platforms to have print have practices and and procedures that demonstrate their credibility and legitimacy in implementing the social values determined by governments. The last line would be, you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Mark Zuckerberg, but I don't want him making decisions about what content I should and should not see. And part of the reason I think I'm a huge fan of Mark's is I think he doesn't want to be in the position of making those decisions, not for financial or pecuniary reasons, but because he thinks that's not an appropriate role for him or his leadership in a company that is an intermediary of mass communications. Lee, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I agree with so much of what Elliot just said. Um, yeah, so I'm Lee, everybody. I'm currently a reporter at Coindesk. In the past, I've worked for organizations like Teen Vogue, Al Jazeera English, the Jerusalem Post. I've been reporting on human rights issues for nearly a decade, and I agree with both what Elliot said and with what Anne said. Where Elliot, I agree that both platforms and governments are doing a terrible job protecting free speech right now. And part of that, as Anne pointed out, is the ability to pursue life, liberty, and happiness myself online. And there are ways that other people are interacting with my digital identity um, or uh, platforms that I use that inhibit my speech that incur uh, limits my freedom. So how do we 
allow people to have the most freedom they possibly can without limiting other people's free speech is I think the core question about digital spaces in general. So I want to dive in. One thing that we kind of all discuss as a group in, in kind of a pre-discussion here um, that goes into this kind of where, what are limits? And I want to talk a little bit about this kind of question about the difference between moderation and censorship. Um, and because I think it's an interesting problem. And I think maybe, maybe an area where, unlike the last question, where I think there seems like broad agreement among, among our panelists, there might be a little bit more uh, controversy, you know, controversy sells, as you guys know. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, give me, give me a sense if you don't mind, you know, how, when we talk about limitations on speech at the government level, at the platform level, et cetera, how do we distinguish between what is effectively, uh, you know, a, a, a form of moderation or ma versus magnification versus outright censorship? It's a really good question. So you, you're going to have to pick people to talk, as I'm sure all, right. all of us have points. Right. And let's start with you. We'll keep going in the same. We'll round robin it. <laughs> oh, but you're muted. Muted. Okay. Uh, well, you know, most people think that um, the differences relate to only government can actually censor and uh, platforms or private entities can't. And, and, and I don't think that's really the um, delineation, <clears throat> it, although it clearly, there are some court cases that say that. Um, I think that the difference is that government, if it censors, if it, if it, tries to stop certain kinds of speech that are um, uh, inappropriate to do, um, they can enforce it. They have that ability to stop that speech entirely, as opposed to platforms, because platforms, you know, you can, you can um, say all kinds of horrible things and, and Mark Zuckerberg's um, minions might take it off of Facebook, but they can still go to 4chan, they can go someplace else. So that is really not really um, ultimately censorship. Yeah, so let me ask a question about that though, because this thing, uh, just to push you on, I'm curious about is, you know, it's a little overly simplistic to think of any platform of Facebook or whatever as a single thing, right? Like there's private speech on it, there are private groups, there's public speech forms. You know, you know, one thing that I always worry about when people start moderating, to your point, Anne, is you're not stopping the speech, you're just pushing it into other channels. Would right. you prefer to have some of these types of things, uh, things that you might not like, right, or, you know, might be important to you, at least said in a public forum where they can be reacted to versus said in private mm -hmm. targeted channels where they cannot? <laughs> so I guess the question in my mind is like, one, how do we think about not just this question of different platforms and the government's ability, but historically the government really couldn't, government couldn't stop you from saying stuff in your home. Like they really couldn't stop right. you stuff from saying stuff in your So how do we think about how the landscape of what is and isn't regulatable in public and private spaces intersect with this question of censorship versus moderation? Well, you know, I, I, I think that um, the idea of having uh, speech that can be countered um, is a, a dream of the past. That doesn't happen on platforms, in fact, because of the way that platforms operate and how they can spread so quickly. Um, it's really impossible to have counter speech that is then going to allow people to, um, you know, have uh, make others to realize that there's something uh, inappropriate or wrong or false about it. And so that I don't think that that's, you know, the standard actually here. I think that the, the, it is true. It's better to have things out in the open, but really what we have seen when things are out in the open often, um, if, no matter what platform they are, people spread them so quickly to their private groups and to other places as well. And it has, and to, to Lee's point, it has stopped other people from feeling that they can speak. It has um, harassed people. It has caused people to uh, drink uh, bleach. Uh, it has done all kinds of things. And so I, I still think that there are important distinctions between the two. So I very much agree with you, Anne, but I want to also add maybe even a little more to what you just said. The ability to speak in private, first off, should not be a matter of public policy, 
but second off is essential to the concept of free speech because we speak differently in small groups than we speak in public. And the idea that we'll be able to counter all the misinformation publicly is very um, ad desirable, but unrealistic when we think about the way that um, disinformation and propaganda in general has been spreading on the internet. So I think the most important thing is protecting the ability of people to speak in private and then moderating what gets amplified in public spaces. So let me push on that though, because in this question of what you can say, first of all, is this question of how do you define a public versus a private space? Mm -hmm. um, and then second, you know, how do we think about, you know, the government has never, or platforms, they've never had the ability to moderate private speech. That just hasn't been part of, censorship did not mean moderation of private speech, ever. Right, so, right? So, so Sam, you raised this, you raised this earlier in another conversation. I actually think the filter of speech and private speech you know, through a First Amendment lens isn't the proper, uh, or not, it's not, it's not a question of proper, isn't a particularly helpful uh, mm -hmm. filter or, or, or framing. I, I think what you and I say in private is it, it should be more appropriately viewed through the, and in terms of what the government can do with respect to the speech that you and I have, that has, that is more appropriately viewed from the standpoint of, uh, of privacy law in terms of the government's ability to intervene or uh, uh, um, interact or suppress or moderate or, or in any way restrict that speech or penalize that speech. I, I, I'm not suggesting that there is no role. I'm just suggesting that the, 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 the legal regime under which governments regulate speech. And again, I'm not a criminal law expert, but I think that would go to issues of conspiracy or, or uh, you know, or, or, or other kinds of legal principles where a criminal act or, a, a, you know, the, you, generally speaking, I believe, and, and now you're really making me harken back to, to law school days. I think it, speech alone is not criminal, even in a private context. It needs to be accompanied by some action. And, and then we're off in a completely separate kind of direction. Uh, there, it may be that the mere act, the act of typing, constitutes an action. The act of clicking constitutes. But and again, maybe you want to have that conversation. Yeah. I'm the wrong panelist. For well, that. no, no, I but I, the, conversation I, the conversation I do want to have, though, is just this question. When you go back to, I think that's a good thing to point out, Elliot. And I don't want to go too far off off kilter here, but I do want to ask this question, which is when we talk about moderation or even censorship, right? Uh, in a world in which the lines between the public and the private spheres has been very, it's been massively complicated at a minimum, right? Um, what laws, like where do you actually set, let's pretend the government wanted to censor right. a certain type of speech. On what? I think that's a great, I think that's a great question. So I, I think it is a really legitimate question as to when does the public space cease to, cease to be a public space? And I think that's a great question. I, I, I believe that is an area that's ripe for public discussion and government intervention. I think there are places where technology, uh, you know, platforms or technology companies can weigh in with tools or with policies and practices. Let's posit that a one-to-one -one communication has a different, as should have, not does, should have a different set of standards around what is considered objectionable. I'll distinguish that from what is considered illegal. It's hard for me to harass Anne, at least I would argue, in a communication that's one, harder for me to harass Anne in a communication that's one-to-one -one than in a communication that's one-to-many or that's many one-to-ones, just as a principle. So, but but, but it, that doesn't... I, I get it, I'm with you, Elliot, but I, I guess I'd ask the other panelists, like when you think about where you'd set a line in a frictionless world of technology, when I can have a million one-to-one -one conversations simultaneously, Right in theory, right? Um, or you know, do you have any 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 thoughts on on how a platform or a government can can think about these as two separate spheres, or do we have to abandon the separation? I think we're already familiar with these kinds of places, right? If I go out in Central Park right now and I smoke a cigarette, someone can come up to me and say, "In this public place, um, we don't smoke cigarettes." And there's like a sign right there that says curb your dog and don't smoke cigarettes. So we have an understanding of certain public places can have certain rules of engagement. We understand that if we're on a rooftop versus in a restaurant, we can behave in different ways. Um, so I think we just need to think about these platforms as a kind of public space, but where you are in the platform can be the difference between being inside a restaurant versus outside on a rooftop versus in a public park. 
Yeah. But you're right. But Lee is right, though. But even as your examples, it, there are at, at not just edge cases at intersections. It can get complicated. I, I, I suppose what I'm, I'm guessing Lee's suggesting and I'm suggesting is, yes, it's an issue that needs to get resolved. But I don't think intellectually it's difficult to say certain spaces require permit greater freedom and, and other places require greater oversight and greater intrusion. And what, what and I, you want to get Yes, on I don't, I don't, I totally agree with both of what they've said, because I mean, there's actually law that relates to this. I mean, there is a case called March versus Alabama that a lot of people have thought about because in private places, um, which this involved, it was a privately owned company town, um, but because it opened up to the public, um, they then said, okay, you are now circumscribed by statutory law and constitutional law on, on what possible uses you could have. And that would be applicable in many ways to the differences between different platforms as well. Right. Yeah, perfect I mean, example, actually, to... Sam, just to give you yeah. a really good, Anne makes a great point, but a perfect example of, of where that's playing out that's relevant to the internet is the whole analogy between internet spaces and like shopping malls. Are shopping malls public spaces and what protections required there? And that is viewed as a shopping mall, as a more public, you know, the, the, I, the mall is viewed as, as a more public space. I feel confident that the fitting room is not. And what you say in the fitting room is different. So. I, I think I, I do think you're right in highlighting that there is a vacuum or an absence or a you know white space for right you know for rulemaking or procedure development. But I think that will evolve, and I'm I'm much more concerned to go back to the, the original question. I'm much more concerned of the fact that we should that, that people are uncomfortable with the idea that moderation is censorship. Censorship is not bad. Saying you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, that's okay. censorship. But that's that's good. I, I want that censorship. So I think we, we you know the word is so emotionally charged that we think censorship is a bad thing. But there are copyright restrictions. That's censorship. So, so I want to I want to I want to I want to throw a, a grenade into this and then Lee I think you're about to jump in. But the grenade I would throw is something someone said to me in an early a, a while ago. I love this. They said, you know, we've never had you've always had the right to speak freely. You just might not have freedom after speech, right? So like, you can say that it's illegal to shout fire in a crowded building. You can still shout fire in a crowded building, right? But you, but the, the, but you just you're gonna have to suffer the consequences of that. And so I also just wonder when we have more sophisticated technology, you know, do we actually in some ways have to strengthen the street protection because enforcement and the ability to pre-censor is a new skill that didn't used to exist? But with that, Lee, I want I want you to chime in because I know you wanted to jump in on that. Actually, exactly want to build on what you just said. So the thing that's the reason people get so emotionally charged when we talk about censorship is because censorship is applied um, unequally, and in particular to groups of people that have less power. And that's why we get so emotional about it, right? So it is not censorship for Instagram to have a policy of uh, no nipples or nudity on the site. It is censorship that they are more likely to apply that policy to small indie lingerie brands than to Victoria's Secret. So it gives, um, it creates a market in which there's not equal access to audience, even if they're paying for advertisement, where they're gonna be suffering more restriction than their competitors who um, are not doing anything different at all, really. So when we think about censorship, censorship is good, but the difference between moderation and censorship is how it's applied. And if it's not applied evenly and consistently, then it becomes discriminatory. Fair enough. And I, I just I, I want to say I agree with that. I just don't think it's a distinction between moderation and censorship. I think censorship applied inconsistently is wrong, and I think moderation applied inconsistently were wrong. So I think the key, and that to go back to how I originally said, I think this is a real failure of the platforms. And again, I, when I say that, I you know I was one of Mark's minions, and so it applies to me as well. Uh, you know, we did not do a good job of being sufficiently transparent so that people understood what the standards are and what the reasons were for decisions and uh, what the what rights it, it had people had to appeal decisions and understand why the, how those appeals were handled. And to be fair, I think Facebook has probably done, again, I'm biased, a better job 
the, uh, than other platforms in addressing these issues. But I think they are all woefully inadequate given the important role they play in communication society. I think a lot more people get their information from Facebook or Twitter or YouTube than 4chan or or even Reddit. And so I do think it's it's not, it is an unusual situation in American society. I think candidly, it is even a more dramatic uh, disparity in importance that these the, the digital platforms have in other societies. And so the responsibility for, as Lee puts it, consistency is even greater on the platforms as that role in pu public debate has taken a, a, an ever greater uh, role. And did you want to hop in on that? Uh, no, but I second that. <laughs> so let me ask a question I hypothetically. Uh, I, I want to look forward to the future. I always look kind of pushing things unreasonably into the future. So it, it, the year is 2035. And just, you know, to pick a, an example, let's put, say the president of the United States says something completely outrageous, right? Um, or wants to say something completely outrageous. How do we think about the spaces where the president can and cannot uh, be, be moderated uh, versus speak freely and say something completely outrageous. <laughs> Sorry, I, want, I, have to, I have to push you. When you say outrageous, you say yeah. something that is legal, you know, make, it makes a statement that's, that's ostensibly legal and yes. would be, is, 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 is the same statement, you know, it, it's, you're focusing on the president. But would anybody else be able to make that statement? I'm just trying to make with, the example extreme. But yeah, let's say anybody, you, I'm trying to push on like, in, in an ideal world, when you guys say the world comes to its senses, we sort out the regulation at the government level versus platform enforcement or whatever that mess is. You know, there's the public, there's a truly public shouting it on Twitter, right? There's the saying it in a private group on Facebook. There's a targeting it out on Facebook. They're saying it in a private message thread with a hundred people or 10 people. You know, there is saying it friends only on Facebook, which, you know, is a scoped audience. Like, do you guys have in your mind, um, I, I think we all kind of have different takes, but largely similar ones on the challenges. Do we have any senses on like where this could land in a healthy place? Healthy place is the key factor there that makes this a hard question. Um, yeah. And I mean, from your regulation I work, yeah. I don't think it's that hard. I don't think it's that I, hard. My feeling is he should, if, if it's legal, he should get to say it wherever, you know, he should get to say it and communicate it however he wants. And in contrast, Anne, again, I, I fear that everybody thinks we're agreeing. I, I couldn't disagree more with Anne when it comes to the point that I believe very strongly in counter speech. I believe that counter speech is a powerful force on, on the web. I actually think counter speech is even more likely to happen when the people who are speaking are prominent and they get widely, uh, their views are widely disseminated. So if the president says something uh, uh, outrageous in 2035, indeed, dare I say, hypothetically, if he says something outrageous in 2020, I think we have mechanisms for accountability for speech in, in, in democracies. It's called elections. And if it's so outrageous, then there can be elections that, that remove people from office. There can be prosecutions. And that's why, as I asked, if they're illegal, uh, question. I, I think the, the other, the corollary to what you're asking is what should be the role of the platform? And my strong belief is the platform should not be the intermediary to say, no, the, plat the president gets to say this, but doesn't get to say that. And indeed, I think that similar restrictions should, you know, similar caution should be applied to people who aren't as famous as the president. Yeah. And what's your take on this? Well, I, you know, I, I, I definitely agree that it's a bad idea to have um, the platforms and uh, your former boss making decisions about what's appropriate and what's not. But we do know that there are some standards that already exist, um, as you mentioned. And, and we can go into the issue about counter speech pretty quickly because there's lots of examples of that. Uh, where there have been things that have been communicated that get spread really quickly and people act on them. I mean, a good example from 2016 was the uh, uh, fact that people armed up to go to the pizza place in DC and that there was no uh, to shoot up the place because Hillary was abusing children and uh, that didn't get the counter speech on that. The fact checking on that didn't come about until much later 
and got many fewer likes and, and shares on Facebook than the yeah. original. So just, but you know, the, the, I, I think that the question though is there are a lot of it, things that are not within the purview of the government to be able to regulate because of First Amendment interpretations by the Supreme Court. And so some of this is going to have to be left to the platforms to be thinking about those things that really are clearly um, contained in the law, like what I've talked about before, falsity um, in elections processes that already is something that uh, Facebook has looked at, um, voter suppression, uh, discrimination, things that target minorities and African Americans and are harassing and, and um, cause civil rights violations that are extreme. I mean, all of those kinds of things are things that really should be done by the platforms. And unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah. So let me, let me, I want to make sure we all have a, 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 everyone has a chance to kind of weigh in before we move on, but I'll point out a few things myself on this that I just think are worth mentioning. One is this question of counter speech, which I would, you know, as a moderator will sneak into the panelist role also really think is important. I think there are some technical components that are really important to keep in mind with it being successful. So for instance, when you take these examples of speech moving very quickly, the counter speech has to move with it, right? And so the problem we currently have is you'll drop a statement into a public situation that will spatter into a thousand places. This counter speech can't happen in a thousand places. And that's not a very thing, a thing we're used to because we're used to kind of more like in the physical world, like there's a speech there's the same channels of communication. So I do think there are some interesting products and decisions about how speech works, right? And what comes with it um, that are interesting. The second thing I'll say, which we'll talk about later, uh, is the authenticity of speech and counter speech, which we'll be talking about both in terms of deep fakes and identity, which is for speech and counter speech to, be, to work as a system, you need to, the people speaking need to have reputations, right? Uh, for it to be meaningful and they need to be real people, right? And so I think thinking about that is gonna be an interesting set of dynamics. Um, but, you know, again, like we'll get more into that and I, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be able to be on a few more panels. So I'll stop there. Guys, I appreciate you joining. Anything you wanna say in closing about kind of how, we're, how we should be thinking about in a more sophisticated way, where we go with these questions of who regulates and what can and can't be said. Um. I just really quick want to, I guess, show a different side. I, I disagree with Elliot about something. I, I believe that until President Trump is speaking directly into my ear and I have a chip that lets me do so, whatever platform it is I'm accessing that information to has a significant responsibility to think about how information is broadcast there and that they shouldn't think that about themselves as the most hands-off. They need to think about like what real world consequences is, are gonna happen to the people that use our products. And then we need to, um, both moderate ourselves. And also when we think about government moderation, governments need to think about limiting the power of any one particular platform and making sure that across the spectrum, people are um, able to make educated choices about how it is they're engaging with the information that the, the platforms themselves have a huge responsibility in terms of what is permitted on their, in their ecosystems. That is the counterpoint. And? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that, um, to just talk about this issue in this context is not enough because we know that one of the things the platforms do is micro-target people based on their particular um, proclivities or race or whatever other reason. And they are selling that and adding that um, ability to spread that information to them. So they do have a responsibility here that I think that they need to have a lot more willingness to moderate more carefully the speech that is causing a lot of the problems that we see, particularly in our democratic processes. So I, I just want to really make clear, I'm not saying platforms don't have responsibilities. I'm just, I, I think they have lots. I'm just saying platforms should not be responsible for making the decisions that Lee is suggesting, which is, it's not that they shouldn't be responsible. We should try as a society to limit the interventions platform make to assess the health or, 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 or damage to special populations. That is the role of government, in my mind, to navigate the balances between communities, the balances between rights, et cetera. 
We can ask platforms to do that. Again, I'm glancing at some of the Q&A. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's wrong to believe that platforms are doing this and, and, and seeking to abdicate this role because they are purely profit-making enterprises. Indeed, one could argue that the, the greater profit might come in, a, in the current environment from imposing greater restrictions. But, but I think, so I believe this is a more principled decision. Mm -hmm. I do, as I said, believe platforms have responsibilities. Their responsibilities should be, should be primarily to demonstrate the legitimacy of their actions and the legitimacy of their actions comes from being transparent, being clear about what their rules are, being clear and consistent as Lee has said, suggested in the applications of their rules. You may not like the rules, uh, that's, that, should, and then that gives you the, and you should have the ability to choose other platforms and, 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 and make other, use other forms of communication. Or you should have the ability to pressure government to change the rules that, in, for, that require uh, uh, platforms to impose certain kinds of restrictions on certain kinds of content. We live in a society where generally government doesn't impose content rules, except as Lee and Ann suggest, where there are specific kinds of harms. And if we believe that those are specific kinds of harms, that's the appropriate role for, for government. The, the platforms should be responsible for implementing those. And by the way, just to allude, that's, that should be the approach for Section 230 in general as well, that, that if we want as an extreme to impose con conditions for uh, liability protection for platforms, it should be that they are clear in what their rules are and they honor their rules and give people appeals, not that they pick and choose what, what standards are most appropriate for the given, you know, the, the emotions of the moment. That's yeah. what, but, but I've gone on too long. Come no, on. I listen, I appreciate you all. I mean, this was a really wonderful conversation. Um, and I appreciate you, you kind of participating in this forum. I think you can see that from the questions, most of which we haven't gotten to, but we'll be sharing and hopefully have a, a continuing discussion on. There's a lot of engagement, um, you know, from, from the group that really cares about these issues that are obviously very timely. Um, thank you all for joining. 